a passage in um, Psalm chapter 1. Just a little bit of a history on this. When I was uh, uh, probably about the fifth or the sixth grade, the church that we were attending uh, in Springfield, Missouri, had a contest, and they challenged all of the children to all the kids that were school aged to memorize this psalm. And so I worked very diligently. Um, memorizing hasn't been one of those things um, that's come easy for me most of my life, but I worked hard. It's only six verses. Right? It's not. It's not a big chapter. But I worked hard to memorize Psalm chapter one, and. And we even got to say it all as a group together before the church, so I didn't even have to <laughs> quote it by myself. But after we finished with that, they handed us all a, a Bible. And that was my, that was my very first Bible that was mine. Uh, so this, this passage has stuck with me through the years. And when I was thinking about what to share, this passage came back to mind. Just by way of introduction, life offers two roads to travel. The way of the righteous or the way of the wicked. God provides, he protects, and he nourishes the righteous. Follow the faith road and God's rewards supersede the benefits of the wicked. He can give you peace so that you can lay down and sleep and awake refreshed and sustained. So we're going to talk about the person that God blesses and the person that God judges. Stand, if you will, as we read this passage together. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Thank you. You may be seated. The theme of this psalm is the happiness of the, un of the godly and the judgment of the ungodly. The psalmist compares and contrasts the godly and the wicked and denotes the eventual end of both. I'd like to kind of take a look at this in those two, two major points, the person God blesses and the person that God judges. And then as we look at those that are the blessed by God, we'll see a contrast in things that they do and do not do, and then also we'll see the comparison. Beginning with the person that God blesses, from the beginning of creation, God has determined to set his affection on a people, to call them his own, to bless this mankind that he had created. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over everything Every, every living creature that moves on the ground. So we see that he's blessing them from the beginning and they are to rule over this creation. If you will turn to Genesis chapter 3, this is, we've got this on the screens, but it's a little bit of a long passage. It may be easier to kind of follow along. Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. So we see in the very beginning of Genesis that God blesses them and he says to them, be fruitful and multiply. And then in chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, 
It is only after sin had entered in the world through Adam's disobedience we find the word curse. And this, this right here in the, in the Genesis, sets up everything that we're going to talk about in Psalm chapter 1. In Genesis 3, verse 14, And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And look down at verse uh, 17. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. So we see this idea of a blessed mankind, and now we see a curse that has come upon mankind. It has always been God been God's desire that mankind should enjoy his blessing. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that the believer in Christ has been blessed with all spiritual blessings. How rich we are in Christ. We can never forget that. In the verses back in Psalm chapter 1, we have a description of the kind of person that God blesses. So let's go back to Psalm chapter 1. Verses 1 through 3 talk about this blessed man. In verse 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in this law he meditates day and night. The very beginning of this, we see the person that's going to be described as this person that is blessed, the blessed man. Blessed can mean several different things. It could be happy or fulfilled. This word blessed here means all of that. The word for man is not gender specific here. So this is, you can think when it says blessed is the man, this is if blessed is the mankind or blessed are all people. So there's no reference to gender here at all. The Christian life to a walk in Ephesians chapter 4. It begins with a step of faith and trust in Christ and placing our faith and trust in Him. And it grows as we take further steps in obedience. So if you have placed your faith and trust in Christ, your walk with the Lord has continued to grow as you continue to take steps in obedience, sometimes in faith. This phrase, blessed is the man, can be thought of in one word, happinesses. Now, if you put that in, in word, it's going to give you a little line under it because it doesn't like that word. It's not really a word we use. I'm not even sure if it's a correct word. But happiness is one thing. The plural of happiness is happinesses. <laughs> and that's a whole other thing. And, and that's what's being described here. When we see, when the psalmist writes, blessed is the man, he is talking about the happinesses that this man possesses. No matter where we turn in the Bible, we find that God gives joy to the obedient and ultimately sorrow to the disobedient. God sets but two persons in this world, and he sees but two. The godly who are in Christ and the ungodly who are still in Adam. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So let's look a little more at the contrast of these two. The differences that we see here in contrast must be demonstrated, lived out, and shown in our lives in how we walk, how we stand, and how we sit. And that is what's described here in these first three verses. Blessed is this man who does not 
walk or who walks not. We're going to see some parallelisms. He's going to draw us some pictures comparing and contrasting some things. Walking beside, and there's a progression here of walking beside, standing with, and sitting beside. Think about your friendships that you have. If you don't know a person and you see them in a restaurant, you don't normally just walk up and sit down with them, do you? Well, that'd be a little bit awkward. You weren't invited to their table. You don't know them. And you just walk in and sit beside them. Now what happens if we back that picture up and you've met them, some acquaintance somehow, been introduced to them? In essence, there was a converging of your paths as you walked in life. Then as you began to know this person, you may have had an opportunity to, to be with them, to spend some time with them, uh, to go to a football game or a baseball game, or you live next door to them and you share conversations. There is a standing with in that relationship now. It's not just a walking beside, it's a standing with. And then ultimately, we can be seated with them, share a meal, share life. So we're going to see this progression unfold. We also see another progression in the words wicked, sinners, and scornful. The imagery of this verse in, in verses 1 through 3 present an, an ideal righteous person who is in the world but is not affected by the world, not their values, their goals, their ambitions. Verse 1 describes the blessed person as one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Notice certain circumstances of the differing character and conduct. The wicked man has his counsel. The sinner has his way. And the scoffer has his seat. So we're going to spend just a few minutes looking at this. The wicked or ungodly man is unconcerned about religion. He is neither zealous for his own salvation or the salvation of others. He, in contrast, advises others to adopt his plan. Don't worry yourself about prayer, about repentance. And he counsels and advises others to adopt his plan. There's no need for such things like honesty. Don't worry about religion. You'll be fine. Blessed is the man who walks not in this man's counsel. The psalmist contrasts the counsel of the wicked with the law of the Lord. We see that we can learn to be aware of scriptures that advise us that there are wolves in sheep's clothing who are always ready to give counsel to all, to teach all, and to offer assistance to all when they are of all men least qualified to do so. Verse 1 again says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, and then this next phrase, nor stands in the way of sinners. The term stand here is a wrong-headedness or a stiff-neckedness, wherein they harden themselves and make excuses in words of malice, having become habitual in their ungodliness, they stand. This word stand is the same word that uh, we get our word statue from. And you've experienced this in the heart of a child. It doesn't have to be your child. It could be any child, right? They stiffen up, don't they? Especially when they're asked to do something that's not in line with what they want to do. We are all sinners saved by grace. You may have seen this in your spouse. <laughs> if we're honest with ourselves, we see this in ourselves also, right? <laughs> this 
self-excused and self-hardening of the ungodly, they appear to themselves to live rightly. With respect to this term, seat, to sit in this seat is to teach, to act as an instructor, to act as a teacher. Matthew 23, verse 2 says, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. That's the idea here. They're giving instruction. The next thing that we see in, in Psalm 1, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. This scoffer um, is brought all religion and moral feelings to an end. We're progressing here to, the, to this word scoffer now that um, has even more of a direct ungodliness appearance. He has set down. He is utterly deep-rooted in wickedness and makes a mock at sin. His conscience is seared and he is a believer in all unbelief. We're told in Psalm that blessed is the man who does not sit down in this seat. Let's look at the contrast. This is what they do not do. Now let's look at what they do. In verse 2 we see, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. This contrast is strong. It's like you couldn't get any more polar opposite than this progression of the wicked and this delight in the law and the meditating on that law. You can't get more opposite than that. Instead of finding enjoyment in the entanglements of the wicked, the godly finds his or her, his or her deep rooted enjoyment and extreme satisfaction and great pleasure in the things of God, particularly God's Word. Verse 2 says, But his delight. The righteous man is now described positively. Instead of finding enjoyment in all of the things that gratify self and the wicked, he finds his delight in the Lord. The law of the Lord refers specifically here to the Pentateuch, the first five books pointing out a path for life in fellowship with him. This idea of delighting in the Lord and his law, he meditates day and night. This word meditates means to mumble. <laughs> Have you ever been caught doing that? You look up and you're thinking about something. You're entrenched in thought. And you look up and you see that someone's looking at you and you realize that you've heard a voice and that that voice was yours. And not only had you been thinking, but so involved and entrenched in thought that you began to speak. <laughs> you were putting voice to your thought. And, you, and it's embarrassing. If, if you've caught someone else doing that, maybe. And maybe even if it's not speaking out loud, it's, it's mumbling to yourself. That's what this word means. When we meditate, it's to mumble to ourselves, to speak to ourselves. Biblical meditation is focusing the mind on Scripture, on godly things. This is what the blessed man is about. This is what he's supposed to do. We're also told that he is like a tree. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. This example of a tree is not just a, a tree that's grown out in the wild. We have some trees that give off all kinds of different fruit, if you want to call it that. <laughs> to reproduce. You can go out and mow in our yard and you'll find little trees all over the place growing out there. This is not that kind of a tree. This isn't a tree that just comes up on its own. This is a tree that's been selected, it's been cultivated, it's been planted, the soil has been prepared. This is the kind of tree that's spoken of here, a, a chosen tree. A, a hand-selected tree. 
It brings forth its fruit in its season. This isn't an, an unseemly type fruit. Right now, as crazy as the weather has been here, my wife is an avid gardener. And sometimes, if the temperature's right, and the rain's right, and the soil temperature's right, you get a harvest. Sometimes, as a season, if it's too early or too late, you'll get fruit that's not timely. It may be out of season. It's not come to its full growth. That's what this is described here. It's, th this man that's planted doesn't have fruit that hasn't come to its full growth. It hasn't come to, its, it, it, to a, a, a value that isn't seen with God's purpose. This fruit is faith and love, joy and patience. Fruitfulness is the central quality of a gracious person. And that production of the fruit should be full and seasonable. Let's turn our attention to the contrast that we see. The person God judges. In verse 4, we see the godless. Verses 4 through 6. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Again, there's a strong contrast here to the person who is blessed and the person here who is going to be judged. This says the wicked are not so. This means that all godly person enjoys and experiences are not true in the life of the ungodly. The godly are compared to a tree, to being strong, beautiful, useful, and fruitful. The ungodly are not that. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 10, we see God as a harvester visiting the threshing floor and separating the grain from the chaff which he will burn. Verse 5 tells us, Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The wicked shall stand there to be judged, but they will not be acquitted. It's not that they won't be present at this judgment. It's that they're not going to be able to stand up under the weight of this judgment. The idea that we saw earlier in standing, like a statue, they will not be able to withstand the judgment that's being cast upon them. One writer said they will be hurled to their knees. The wicked shall not stand in judgment. Having been rejected by Christ, they will be flung to their knees in confession of sin and the truth of God's word and his son. God is said here to know those of whom he approves and on whom he lifts up the light of his countenance and his blessing. Why are the ungodly lost? Because they will not submit to Christ and his word. They prefer the counsel of the ungodly to the whole counsel of God. They prefer friendship of godless people to the congregation of the righteous. They spend their days thinking about sin, not about the word of God, not meditating on it. They think they are secure in this earth, but they are only chaff. How can a believer practice verse, verses 1 through 3 that we've seen and and not be judged. One is our faith and trust in Christ, and then how do we continue to grow in that? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, the godly are a living sacrifice. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your 
spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How would, can we renew our mind? Meditating on the Word. We need, to be, we need to catch ourselves mumbling all the time. God has set before us two choices. If you want the Lord to protect you, provide for you, and nourish you, why pursue the path that leads to judgment? Consider the path you're on now. Are you weary? Are you despairing? Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God's design from the beginning was to bless mankind and to give peace. What changes do you need to make in your life to either experience this peace or to, co to continue to experience the happinesses of the person that is blessed? If you do know the Lord as Savior, perhaps you need to recommit to loving His Word, to obeying His Word, and to meditating on it day and night. If you want to be at peace with God in this life and in the life to come, submit yourselves to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and you will experience your, for yourself the blessedness that comes with being in a, relight, a right relationship with Christ. I pray that perhaps from these scriptures, renewing our minds to these, you will be encouraged to respond to God's calling on your life, wherever you may be. Let's pray. Father, as we come into your presence again and into your into your word and we see that you tell us there are but two paths and there are but two people that you see. Those who are acquitted and those who bear the responsibility of their own sin. Father, I pray that you would continue to call us to you either by faith and repentance or by continued sanctification in repentance. Either way, we need to be a repenting people. I pray that you would help us to, to understand the difference between these two people and that you have desired to bless mankind from the very beginning. And I pray that you would help us to see our responsibility to trust you, to obey you, that our delight would be found in your word and that we would meditate on that day and night. Help us to respond to your calling and your leading in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.